Majora's Mask. Chapter 33. Illusions in the Ice. You are already leaving this land of Hyrule, aren't you? The boy found it hard to meet her eyes. I'm not answering that, he thought. I don't know what she expects me to say. Even though it was only for a short time, I feel like I've known you forever, Zelda said. I'll never forget the days we spent together in Hyrule Link, and I believe in my heart that a day will come when we'll meet again. Until that day comes, please take this. She handed him the deep sea blue ocarina. Tears already stained his cheeks as he approached the large, elegant bed. His eyes hardly noticed the guards and attendants surrounding her, or daylight darkening into night. He saw only his beloved lying still. I am praying. I am praying that your journey be a safe one. Her eyes were closed and her golden hair framed a ghastly pale face. Her fingers refused to react to his touch. Please, don't forget me. Don't forget Hyrule. You'll come back, won't you? I'm sorry, Zelda, he said. The whisper barely escaped him. I, I came back, but I was too late. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. A sore back opened Link's eyes from his dream-infested sleep. The forest floor wasn't comfortable. He lay against a tall, strong tree underneath the leaves' canopy of darkness. I can't tell if it's night or day, he thought. His long, funnel-shaped hat was still up against the tree when he sat up, serving as his pillow. The ocarina rested in his left hand. Zelda, Link remembered. The drawbridge was the last time he'd seen her alive. This ocarina and Epona were now the only two relics of his life in Hyrule, and he vowed to never let either leave his sight. Link stood up, brushing off the dirty lower half of his tunic as he got to his feet. He looked around in the misty darkness of the uncharted forest, wondering how much longer he would be traveling through it. His second journey out of Hyrule had been completed, and he was now on the other side of Death Mountain, past the northern border. He remembered the first time. He'd barely made it across when the messenger stopped him with news of Zelda's disease. This time, no message came. This time, he continued to cross, because there was nothing left to do and no one else to return to. Each step was a numb trance, empty of meaning and purpose. Link opened a small bag of Deku nuts on his belt and popped a few into his mouth, going over to pet Epona. He stroked the white stripe running along her nose. Hey girl, did you sleep well? Epona buzzed her lips, bending her head away from his hand to the bucket at the base of the tree she was reined to. The pail was empty, so Link picked it up and walked to a small stream they'd rested beside. As Link bent to fill it, he heard a familiar noise behind him. It was a sort of twinkling, chime-like sound that faded quickly, but it was also filled with some characteristic of life. He spun around on his feet, dropping the pail of water and letting it spill back into the stream. Navi? However, nothing was there. Link looked back and forth in search of the noise, even rounding the trees circling his small camp to see if anything was flying away. His small flame of hope died. <sighs> Come on, Epona. Link said, walking over to her reins with a sudden urge to start moving again. Soon, Link once again found himself riding alone through the misty forest, in its mysterious, lifeless darkness. The only noises to echo through the woods were Epona's footsteps on the harsh, twig-infested grass. They pushed on, nonetheless, no true destination in mind. Thump, 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 thump. The horse's footsteps kept their rhythmic tempo, and Link felt his head bobbing with it. His eyes grew heavier. 
The great Deku tree wants to talk to you. Link, get up! <sighs> I don't want to, Link said, going further and further into his half-sleep. The first time he'd ever met Navi replayed in his memory. Hippona trudged forever onward through the forest as her master fell asleep. <sighs> I'm... I'm too tired. I had a bad dream. Hey, come on! Can Hyrule's destiny really depend on such a lazy boy? What do you mean, Hyrule's? Link, get up! Navi, I can't... Link, Link, get up! Get up, get up, get up, get up. Suddenly, Epona whined loudly and reared up on her hind legs. Link's eyes shot up in surprise. He instinctively grasped for the horse's reins and his fingertips barely snagged them. He steadied himself as he adjusted to the waking world. He noticed a bright ball of white light in front of his face. A, a, a fairy. She was stressed and panicked. Something was horribly wrong. Navi! Link! His guardian fairy shouted. You have to get up! He's here! Link's mouth wavered. He was too dazed to speak, and before he could ground himself, Epona abruptly froze. She started trembling terribly beneath him, as if stuck and afraid. Link looked past Navi and saw a hooded figure only several feet away. The tall person was garbed in black from head to toe, and their hood was drawn. The stranger stared intently at his horse, though all their features were hidden. Navi spun around and saw the cloaked figure herself. No! She said. She left, flying to confront the assailant. Link tried to pull Epona's rein, still not understanding the situation or why his horse couldn't move. Navi! Link said. He could feel immense danger in the air. You said you'd leave him alone! Navi said, screaming at the dark figure. You promised you wouldn't hurt him, you liar! Get out of here! Get out of here and never come back! Suddenly, the cloaked figure turned from Epona to his fairy. Epona unfroze. His horse reared high again, surprising Link and tearing the reins away. He spun as he fell. In the distance, he heard a sickening, snapping sound cut cleanly through the air. His back slammed into hard-packed dirt, knocking the wind from his chest. The world spun and blurred. His head throbbed painfully. Epona fled in terror, leaving behind the three of them as she dashed through the forest. Link struggled to stand and regain his breath. Then he saw Navi falling to the ground. Her light had gone out. The fairy's dull, gray body drifted slowly through the wind. His eyes then found the hooded figure standing before him, and the blood in his veins froze. He saw its face, a redead's. The decaying cheeks and dark, endless eyes became Link's entire world. He couldn't move a muscle. Even looking away was impossible. As the dark being stepped towards him, its grip over his body intensified. He couldn't cry for help. He couldn't blink. All he could do was continue staring into the hood. He thought he saw a pair of eyes hidden in those deep pits, as if they were hidden beneath the surface of the redead face. A final explosion of pain ripped the world away for good. He collapsed, losing consciousness as the figure stared at his fallen body. Link and Navi ventured across a vast, seemingly endless field. The verdant hills rolled on to connect the forest, the mountains, the castle, the lake, the desert, and the many villages scattered throughout the expansive kingdom. It brimmed with light, as if only a dream to be shattered by the slightest disturbance. Navi, what do you think is going to be here after Hyrule? What do you mean, after Hyrule? You said it, leave him alone! You promised you wouldn't hurt him, you liar! Get out of here! Get out of here and never come back! Consciousness returned for a moment. He lay on his stomach over Epona, ropes securing him tightly to his horse. Epona walked calmly forward. Link lifted his head to see the cloaked figure who'd attacked them. It was facing away from him, and his horse's reins were in its gloved hands, leading her onward. They were on a rocky cliff with the forest to their right and a sharp edge on their left. A body of stormy water splashed onto the cliff and dashed the rocks with foam. Ahead was a small shack, gray and feeble. The structure was weathered and ancient. The figure approached it, 
Link discovered no more. His head fell limply back onto his horse as darkness returned. I'll never forget the days we spent together in Hyrule, Link. And I believe in my heart that a day will come when I shall meet you again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to help. Suddenly, Link felt like he was falling. He plunged downward into the depths of a non-existent hole. His eyes opened, and he realized that he was falling. The dreams had been replaced with a new, horrifying reality. He soon lost his stomach, letting out a scream as he fell further blindly. <coughs> Link's breath didn't last long, and then he fell without sound, descending deeper into the chasm. Then, an entirely new feeling filled him. Visions flashed across his mind, and he saw an endless procession of faces and events played out before him over and over. He saw them repetitively, the same things, the same people, the same actions, as if he'd entered some loop that never ended, repeating back to the beginning every time. The feeling intensified until it was a part of him. It was still there. But now he had been forced to accept it and call it his own, never again to be rid of it. The entire time he continued spinning through the air and then... He stopped falling. Link opened his eyes. They found the cave wall. His back still faced the open window overlooking Snowhead's main room. He lay there for a moment, resting his head against the green hat acting as his pillow. What in the name of Din was that dream? Link thought. It only came to him in bits and pieces. Navi had been there, even though he hadn't dreamed of her in quite a while. The re-dead creature in Zelda had been a part of it too. Somehow, all those memories and images had gotten mixed up. I must have been really, really tired. He could hardly recall the dream anyways. The narrative already slipped from his mind as he awoke. Link yawned, rolling over to see if Tail was still asleep. However, all he found was his bag. The purple fairy was no longer on top of it. He sat up when a quick sweep of the room found nothing. Uh, a tail? He said, stumbling to his feet. How long was I out? Link wondered. Did something take Tail? The ground suddenly shook, and Link used the wall to stop himself from falling. As the entire temple trembled, he recognized the moonquake. They always happened throughout the third day, which meant it was no longer the night of the second. No! How far into the day was it? Exactly how many hours had been lost? There was no way of knowing. But when the earthquake ended, he quickly placed his hat on and threw his bag over his shoulders. He was wide awake and would make up for lost time. He looked around the room one last time for Tail, but there was no trace. If anything had kidnapped him, the monster had for some reason left himself completely untouched. It was unlike Tail to venture off on his own. And then it hit him. Tail abandoned him. He recalled how oddly the Purple Fairy had been acting ever since they reached Snowhead. But I didn't press the matter, because I was too tired. The entire time, Tail had been contemplating ditching him, and that was the decision he'd made. Without a goodbye, or an explanation, his nap had been the perfect opportunity, which must have been why he was so insistent on it. Whether out of fear or lack of hope in Link's cause, Tail was gone. Link's chest flared with pain when he realized he was alone again. He'd lost yet another companion. Just like Zelda, Navi, Pona, the first tattle, Anju. When those memories threatened to steal his breath, he shook them away, suppressing the ache in his heart. You're not completely alone, Link reminded himself. There's one person out there left for you. Tail may have abandoned him, but Tattle still needed his help, and he wouldn't let her down. He continued along the ascending tunnel, and soon, the large central chamber's light faded as he left the window behind. He retrieved a piece of stale cold bread, which was all his remaining food. It was almost painful to bite into, but he forced himself to chew and swallow. Eventually, 
the cylindrical chamber's light returned. He re-entered the room at a much higher level than before, finding himself on one of the long ramps ending abruptly in the room center. There was an identical one protruding from the wall across from him, as well as to his left and right. None of them met in the middle. However, each ended in a sharp incline upward. To make a Goron jump possible, Link realized. The stone ramp was covered in a thick sheet of ice. It would easily support his weight as Darmani. I don't have a fairy this time to warn me how dangerous this is, Link thought. Veering at all while rolling would cause him to plummet all the way to the bottom, Navi would tell him. If he hesitated when approaching the end, he wouldn't gain enough momentum and would fall, Tattle would argue. Tail would caution him that there had to be another way across, allowing for safer passage. But Tail's opinion didn't matter to him much in that moment. Why was he so persistent that I reached Snowhead? Why had he waited until now to abandon him? Here? One explanation was that it had taken him a while to find the courage to do it. But wasn't it Tail that wanted me to free the final giant? If it hadn't been for him, Link would have been sidetracked searching for Tattle. Tail had redirected him to Snowhead the entire time, even after the fairy must have thought about abandoning him. <sighs> Questions I don't have the answers to, he thought. Link applied the Goron mask, but it was Darmani who rolled into the Goron ball. He aligned himself with the ramp and rolled at full speed, hitting the edge and arcing high. Link reached the lip of the other side, rolling several feet across the slick ice before stopping. The other side's cave opening was frozen shut with ice. That'll take way too long to hack through with my sword, he thought. There was another option. An avalanche had created a pseudo-ramp along the wall's corner. Snow covered it to make rolling across as a Goron possible, though he'd have to be careful again. Link eyed it for a moment longer before deciding to risk it, using his sixth sense to guide him successfully. On the next ramp, there was a thick stone door just beside him and one across from him on the opposite side. Neither were hindered by ice, bars, or chains, and both seemed liftable in his Goron form. The choice was his, and Link hoped one of them possessed his trap giant. I'll probably be up against another evil mask, Link sighed. His gut told him to roll across to the other side's door, and he did just that. His gloved Goron hands pushed hard on the new door's surface. He lifted it until there was just enough space to put his hands underneath and slide through. As he entered the new room, the door slid shut behind him. He wasn't alone. An old man stood in the center of the room. Or what might have been a man at some point. The skeletal, emaciated creature seemed less human the longer he looked. He had a long, drawn face, and his perceptive yellow eyes spotted the hero immediately. He wielded a staff taller than his entire body, and its top glowed a brilliant blue. His skin was a darker shade of blue, and brown linen golden-hemmed robes adorned him, its sleeves stopping just short of his hands. He stared at Link solemnly and did not stir. Who are you? His voice was cracked and ancient. A patch of white hair crowned his head, and a thick white beard covered his jaw. Uh, I'm... Link stopped when he noted the fear in his own voice, and he stood tall before speaking again. I am Dormani the Third. The square stone room was small. The walls had images of Goron warriors in battle, though only archers were depicted. Their bows were drawn tight, arrows poised to strike down wolfos, bears, and a manner of other wildlife. Several of the savage mountain fauna were set aflame, frozen solid, or afflicted by some burning golden light, while others simply bled to death. The Gorons were triumphant on all four sides. The center of the room was decorated with a golden square on the floor, and paintings of a ball of fire, ice, and light swirled around it. The old man stood on top of it. Why are you here, Dermani the Third? His staff's blue light pulsated, while white beams of energy orbited it. The new entity's gaunt face was hard to read. This is Snowhead Temple, and it belongs to the Gorons, Link said. I came here to free it of its curse. 
I am a hero to my people. <laughs> a hero, the creature said, smiling. Do you know what a wizard robe is? Link's brow furrowed. No. Then I guess you won't be expecting this. The creature pointed its staff at Link, and a blue ball of light erupted out. It struck Link in the chest, and a thick wall of ice sprung from the magical attack and surrounded him. He only had time to bring his hands to his face before his entire body was encased. The cold gripped him immediately. Even his Goron body lost its warmth as the cold prison paralyzed him. He could still see through the thick prison. The Wizrobe casually walked toward him, amused by Link's slightly agape mouth and fingers almost touching his face. The hero's heart fluttered as his mind reeled. He could only watch as the Wizrobe approached. The staff clanked on stone with each step. I needed more gems, but the Goron Armory only had two left, the blue creature said. The room grew blurrier the longer the cold ate away at Link. His mind felt so numb, even as sharp needles of pain broke out elsewhere. Be glad I chose ice, or your death would have been an agonizing inferno. <laughs> the whiz rope stopped when they were inches apart, his nose brushed against the ice separating them. Link tried to fight off the cold, but he knew it was useless. He couldn't move his arms, legs, or any part of his body. His mind flashed to the re-dead creature and its dark pits for eyes. He remembered the pain, as he had been under its control as it had forced the blood to rush to his head and knock him out. Twice, he remembered. Navi had awoken him from a doze while riding a Pona. Before they could speak, the re-dead creature had taken hold of his horse, but it had turned on Navi when she started yelling. There had been a horrible snapping noise before he'd been taken hostage. Navi's neck! Link's mind continued numbing as the memories filled his vision and replaced the whiz robe. The re-dead creature had been in Hyrule, and somehow it had followed him to Termina, tattle and tail ambushing him, the Skull Kid robbing him, Link holding onto his horse as Epona galloped away, the slender cut in his leg, the hole he'd run into. All of that seemed an illusion. Uh, no! He felt his mind slipping, but he had to focus. He was going to die. The cold would kill him. It was killing him. Focus! Focus! He strained his eyes to concentrate on the whiz robe, hardly feeling his own fingers on his face. <clears throat> That's it! Link used the last bit of consciousness he had left to will the mask off, using all his strength to barely twitch his fingers. And there was a flash of light. He completely enveloped the block of ice. The whiz robe stumbled backward, and as he regained his balance, the sorcerer looked up to find a blonde boy in brown winter clothing and a green hat. The Goron mask was in his hand, and the ice was gone. Link collapsed. All energy had been sapped away. Warmth returned to its body, though it put him back in shock as feeling returned to his limbs. Another sorcerer, the whiz robe stammered in awe. His eyes were wide as Link looked up. However, the magical creature was already preparing his staff to release a second ball of ice. Link jumped to his feet with his remaining strength, and the cold missile barely missed. He fell to his knees, regaining his breath as he drew his sword, but he still was not strong enough to stand. So Link threw his sword instead, and the weapon almost pierced the whiz robe. But his enemy somehow vanished, evading the throw. The creature reappeared across the room, and his third magical attack was aimed for Link's sword. The moment his blade slammed into the wall, the ice attack froze it in place, trapping it. The distraction gave Link enough time to find a reserve of energy. He stood, rolling away from the fourth missile, and when he faced his foe next, they recognized each other as battle-ready enemies. Was that your only magic trick? The whiz robe said. A twisted smile returned to his lips. I'm afraid that doesn't bode well for you, Damani the Third. He raised his staff again, and Link prepared to dodge it. However, this one was also not aimed at him. The ball of ice landed on the ground, and the whiz rope continued pouring magic into the stone in a constant stream. A wolfo soon jumped from the pool of swirling energy, but it was a monster devoid of flesh. 
The creature was made entirely of ice, clear and glittering in the light pouring from the open ceiling. Its blue eyes found Link, nails and teeth as sharp as its animal counterpart. The beast of ice ran on all fours to attack, and another magical missile came from behind it too, aimed at Link. He rolled away as the wolf was pounced, hearing the missile crash behind him. He held out his shield as the dog's icy paws slashed out. They grabbed the metal, tearing savagely for Link. One claw caught his left shoulder, and red flecks of blood shot out to speckle the monster's clear, icy flesh. Link bared his teeth in pain, struggling against the wolfos as he put on the Goron mask. His shield disappeared with his human form, and the wolfos fell at his feet. Link grabbed the beast around the waist and slammed its head into the wall. The beautiful creature's head shattered into hundreds of ice crystals, and the magical light left its eyes. It was now a broken sculpture, devoid of power. Link spared no time to celebrate, looking over to see the Wizrobe conjuring another pool of ice magic. Four beasts identical to the first leapt from the portal this time, each immediately finding its prey. They approached in the pack, and Link knew he couldn't hold them all off. As the first one leapt, Link curled into a ball. Its claws met his hard back. An ear-grating, scraping sound replaced injury as ice claws met rock, though the fury of slashes began to turn Link around and reveal his soft underbelly. He hoisted his rolled body into the air, and the wolfos hung on to him as he ascended. When he crashed back into the floor, the monsters were beneath him. They all shattered on impact, joining the first minion to become a lifeless pile of ice. His extra sense revealed the Wizrobe's staff rearing for another attack. He rolled away, and the missile's cold breath washed over him as it missed. Link stood to face the Wizrobe, who was safely across the room. You tire yourself needlessly, the sorcerer said. You won't be leaving this room alive as a Goron or a boy with such a crude fighting strategy. The Wizrobe cast another spell at the doorway, blocking it by ice. Just like so many other doors in the temple, Link thought, realizing how they'd ended up that way. He returned to his enemy and decided he was right. Fighting as a Goron was too tiring. He took his enemy's advice and removed the mask, wielding his bow instead. Link sidestepped the next attack and notched an arrow. When he released the projectile, the Wizrobe vanished before it made contact. Link immediately notched another, expecting his enemy's reappearance. What he had not expected was him reappearing four times. Two pairs of identical whiz ropes surrounded him at each corner of the room. He lowered his bow, confused only for a moment. <laughs> You're not much of a hero if you can't tell your enemy from his illusion. The four beings spoke split seconds apart from one another to create a terrible echo. Link ignored the disorienting sound and released his arrow. It traveled straight through one target's heart, though the false Wizro vanished into a wisp of smoke. His mind went to the lens of truth, but he knew there wasn't time to use that alongside his bow. Damani the Third will die tonight, and Master will bury his people beneath the moon. The echo disarmed him. Link tried and failed to shut its horrible dissonance out, his eyes going back and forth between the illusions. He released another arrow and destroyed a second illusion. Link notched a fourth arrow as it spoke again. The hero of Gorons will be murdered by a lowly thief ransacking his stolen temple. I wonder how that makes his feeling. That one, Link thought, noting an origin for the echo. He released the arrow as he spun to face his true target, but the whiz robe vanished like before. The sorcerer's remaining illusion disappeared with him. The whiz robe appeared beside him and knocked Link upside the head with his staff. Link fell, turning and drawing his shield as the whiz robe raised his staff again. A beam of ice emerged this time, striking his Hylian relic and pushing him harder into the ground. Link winced as his shoulders were pushed down and the hero tried to match the magic beam's strength. It never ended as the Wizrobe willed the ice to come out faster. He heard crackling ice as his shield began to freeze. I can't hold this much longer, he thought. The Wizrobe merely pushed harder, knowing he had his prey cornered. The magic creature knew in only a few seconds that Link would be overpowered. That's why it came as a surprise when the hero dropped his shield early. Something that wasn't a Goron or a boy rolled out from behind it. 
The Deku scrub released a ball of green goop, hitting the wizrobe in the face. The magic creature stumbled backward, and the stream of magic ended. Link's frozen shield fell to the floor as the wizrobe instinctively waved his staff again, though he was blinded, so his aim was far off. He wiped the muck away and spotted a human again, with an arrow notched and already pointed. Link released the string. The arrow went straight through the wizrobe's stomach. He opened his mouth in shock and vanished nonetheless. Link turned to find his enemy reappear, hunched over his new wound. Illusions conjured themselves again, but they were hazy and unconvincing, each unable to come fully into existence. Link pulled another arrow from his bag and launched it into the wizrobe's chest. All the illusions disappeared into smoke, but the wizrobe still did not relent. As he leaned against the wall for support, his enemy poured more magic into the floor. When Link retrieved another arrow, a wolfos emerged from the mist. It, however, was missing two hind legs. The poorly created creature dragged itself with its front paws. The beast's eyes came into existence wide with terror. Link fired a third arrow into the other side of the wizard's chest. He gasped in pain again, and this time, the staff fell from his fingers. The wizard collapsed to its knees, looking up at Link as the ice wolfos continued crawling away. <laughs> you were wrong, Link said. I had one more magic trick. The old blue man tried to reply, but only blood could spill from his mouth. Dark stains flowered on his robes as the whiz robe fell onto his face. He never moved again. A pool of blood slowly surrounded Link's motionless enemy. The two-legged wolfos shattered as soon as its master died. The blonde boy stood panting, victorious as he lowered his bow and stared at his felled foe. He closed his eyes while the adrenaline fell. <laughs> Thank Din, he thought. He'd avoided yet another close call. One of hundreds, maybe th thousands. Which couldn't be good for his longevity. An earthquake pulled him from his thoughts. Link lost his footing, but didn't fall, recognizing the cycle's worst quake yet. No, he thought in despair. I have to hurry. He examined the battle's aftermath. A frozen door, his sword frozen against the wall, shattered remains of ice monsters, and a bloody corpse. His own left shoulder still flared with pain, too, though it had stopped bleeding. Up against the back wall, practically blending in with the Goron artwork, was a shelf of weapons and armory. Link recalled the Wizrobe's comment about robbing it. The only weapon left on the rack, however, was a longbow. He guessed the rest had been stolen or used long ago. Link approached the remaining bow, noting a shining gem on its upper limb. He retrieved the weapon and ran his finger along the dark gray wood. The longbow was the size of the one in his bag, but the black string was in much better condition. What caught his attention the most, however, was the bright red gem encrusted into it. The red crystal bared the image of a flame. Its surface was smooth, and Link noted two identical holes beside the fire gem. They were simply empty. He remembered the whiz rope talking about choosing ice over fire as his weapon. Maybe this bow is magical, like his staff, and it has room for different kinds of attacks, too. One hole must be for an ice gem, but what about the third? Link turned to look at the magical staff. It had grown dull with the Wizrobe's death, and there was no additional gem on its surface. Whatever artifact it had wielded was now consumed. But this bow's isn't, Link thought. He decided to test the new weapon. He pulled another arrow from the quiver in his bag, placing its knock on the black string and pulling it taut. He stared at the arrow as, suddenly, the point gave birth to fire. Link's eyes widened. The flame remained on the steel end and didn't spread along the shaft. The heat radiated over his face, but it posed no danger to him. The gem glowed fiercely the entire time the magical fire crackled. A fire arrow. Link smiled. The fire was warm and welcoming compared to Snowhead's cold. As soon as he willed it to happen, the fire vanished and the gem went dull again. He had complete mental control over activating the magic. He turned on the fire again and released an arrow at the doorway. The barrier exploded with orange light as the flames traveled quickly over its icy surface. 
and melted fast, and Link watched in amazement as a puddle of water soon replaced the obstacle. This'll come in handy, Link thought. Though he couldn't carry two bows around, Link approached the weapon rack and placed the bow he'd found at Woodfall Temple on it. It was a poor replacement for the magical weapon, though it'd likely be a long time before anyone was in here again. Link made mental notes to retrieve his fallen arrows and search the Wizrobe's belongings one more time. For now, he turned to his frozen sword. The boy drew an arrow, notched it against his new string, and watched as there was fire. <laughs>